Okay, well, if you go ahead and join me in turning your Bibles to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Of course, we're continuing our study in love. Um, it's been uh, wonderful so far. This is uh, week three. Week three. <clears throat> and we're getting pretty uh, in-depth here, so I'm, I'm excited to continue on. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to read verses 4 through 7 again. And this will actually be our source text for next week as well. So we'll be hanging out here in 4 through 7 next week as well. And then we'll move on to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the ending of 1 Corinthians 13. So 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. If you didn't bring your Bibles, uh, it's right up here on the screen. So it says this. I know most of us are probably familiar with this passage, but as you've seen, if you've been here the past few weeks, uh, we're not nearly familiar enough, are we? Let's look at this again. Beginning in verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not grab. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. How many of you remember what that word means from last week? That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Provoked means, for those of you working here, to sharpen your sword with the goal to separate. That's what the Greek means. Provoked. Every time you provoke an anger, it's you're sharpening your sword to separate. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So it's clear from Scripture as we begin to unpack this and look at these next category that I've divided these up, uh, all these uh, phrases up into, that love, true love, God's love, the, God, the love that God showed us, which is that agape love, which is what we're talking about here, agape, the definition of that agape. Um, that love is self-sacrificing, isn't it? Look at some of these things here from our text. <clears throat> love does not brag and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Those things are uh, really a description of a self-sacrificing love, a love that gives of itself. And we, as we discussed over the past few weeks, this agape love that we've been examining, um, it derives from God. And so, of course, in order to define it properly, we have to look at God's love towards us. And we've been doing that in depth. We'll do it again this morning. But agape love is not a human love. It's not a human-defined love. It's not a love that was created by man and then expressed man to man. It's a love that was created, given to us by God through the Holy Spirit. And now we are commanded, actually, which we looked at two weeks ago, to express this type of love to one another. And as I thought about this this week, and this, 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 uh, this notion that true love is self-sacrificing, it gives of oneself, um, who's more self-sacrificing than God? Right? He gave his only son to be put to death on the cross so that we might be forgiven. Even though we didn't deserve it. So self-sacrificing is something that God is very familiar with. He gave his son. Jesus Christ, the son, is very familiar with self-sacrifice. And so God's love is really the embodiment of self-sacrifice. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Last week, last week we talked about the steadfastness of love. How it remains. It's a constant. It never ebbs. It never flows. At least the true love we're supposed to have for God and for God's people. This week we're going to talk about the self-sacrificing uh, portion or idea behind this agape love. And we are to show one another this sacrificial love as well. And that's what we want to talk about this morning. But there's a big problem in the hearts of mankind, isn't there? Huge problem. We know the problem is sin. But self-sacrifice doesn't come natural to us, does it? It doesn't come natural to us. It's something we have to work at. It's something we have to be reminded of. The thing that comes natural to us is the opposite of self-sacrifice, which is self-love. Self-love comes very natural to us. Uh, you can see it, especially for those of us who have young kids, you can see it right away. And you have to begin to correct that very early on in your children. This idea of self-love, providing for self above all things. And really at the heart of, a, of, of, of mankind, this self-love is really the sin of pride. So we're going to kind of talk about that a little bit this morning and how that is in constant war against us as Christians, pride. See, God calls us to be humble, and the humble will self-sacrifice. The proud will self-love. But I think we've, in a lot of ways, uh, 
which we'll get into in a moment, we've, we've, we've lost this, this practice of this in the church, the practice of self-sacrifice in the church. Pride is far more dangerous than I think we fully understand. And really, as we look at and examine the character traits of true love, this agape love we're supposed to have for one another, it'll become more and more clear. In fact, throughout history, pride has been recognized by many great writers of the Christian faith, and even many uh, inspired writers of the scriptures, pride has been recognized as probably one of the deadliest sins in the life of mankind. Right? King Solomon wrote a lot about pride. For those of you who read through the Proverbs, there are countless verses on the dangers and the pitfalls of pride or this notion of self-love. Self-love. Uh, St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, these men were a lot about pride and the dangers. Uh, uh, more recently, Jonathan Edwards, John Stott, C.S. Lewis wrote a lot about this idea of pride, or in some of their writings, they identified it as self-love. Self-love or pride is the opposite. That's what I want to get at. The opposite of what 1 Corinthians 13 teaches us. Self-love and pride is the opposite of what 1 Corinthians 13 teaches us. But something has happened in this culture especially, and again, I can only speak for this culture because it's the only one I live in. Something has happened with pride. You see, we live in a culture where pride or self-love is actually celebrated as a virtue. Self-love is celebrated as a virtue. The Bible, the Bible tells us that we are to love God and others more than we love ourselves. But this culture teaches us that the more we love ourselves, the more self-esteem we have, the healthier we, healthier we are. Pride and arrogance are not just prevalent among the rich of society, the powerful, the successful, the famous, and even among many religious leaders, both well-known and unknown alike. Pride or self-love is thriving in the hearts of probably every one of us here to some degree, and especially in the hearts of ordinary people throughout God's church. And I think in many ways, we be, we become numb to self-love. American culture revolves around the power of the individual, doesn't it? Revolves around the power of the individual. We are a self-serving people. We seek to protect ourselves and our family first, provide for ourselves and our families first, exalt ourselves and our family first. We want what we want, when we want it, and we want it yesterday. That is really the culture that we live in. The culture that we live in. We are taught in public schools from preschool right on up to the universities that holding yourself in high esteem, holding yourself in high esteem is vitally important to your emotional health. Taught that very young. I can remember hearing about that all the time in school growing up. But that's man's wisdom, church. Holding yourself in high esteem is man's wisdom. Wisdom. God tells us the opposite. Let's look at Mark 12, 28 through 31, just quickly together, to kind of look at what God actually commands us. Mark 12, 28 through 31. It'll be up on the screen as well. It says this. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, this is Jesus, asked Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? What's the greatest commandment, your translation might say? Jesus says this, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and with all, or with all, and with all your strength. The second most important commandment is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There are no other commandments greater than these. So we're taught in this society that self-love, self-esteem is healthy for us, a high view of ourselves. God tells us that a higher view of him and others is far more important. Uh, now, I don't know where we fall on this list. Jesus only gives us number one and number two. I don't know if self comes number three. Probably not. But in God's economy, loving yourself or self-love is not a priority. Loving others is a high priority. And self-love is a very dangerous fire church. It's damaging to our walk with God. It actually hinders, it hinders our relationship and our communion with God. But it also greatly affects the way we love one another 
can treat one another, right? We've talked about that in this society, right? Forgiveness is, uh, is not existent in this society. Like I said, whether somebody offended you a day ago or a hundred years ago, we do not let anything go. We want to make people pay in this society for what they've done to us. And that, brothers and sisters, is from the devil, plain and simple. That is Satan's work in this society. We are called right to forgive, to have compassion, to release our bitterness, release our anger. Those types of things are what we are called to. Pride prevents us from doing that. Pride prevents us, from, this idea of self-love prevents us from letting go of past offenses. And this is what I want to discuss today. Not only how does pride damage our walk, or self-love damage our walk with the Lord, but how can we combat that? What is, what's the prescription from Scripture that God gives us so that we are not slaves to our anger, our unforgiveness, our uncompassion, our bitterness, and our self-love? How can we be released from that? We'll talk about that this morning. But can you and I truly love each other the way we are called to if we love ourselves more than we love our neighbor? Can we really accomplish what God has called us to we talked about last week when God calls, says that we will be known, that we will, it will be, be known to be Jesus' disciples by how we love one another, right? Well, the culture doesn't realize uh, that we're of Christ, most churches, because we don't love each other well. We don't love each other the way God has called us to. We don't love each other with this powerful, radical, agape love, this self-sacrificing love. Again, I've broken down these phrases from 1 Corinthians 13 into three separate categories. Last week, we looked at the steadfast character traits of love. This week, we're going to look at the self-sacrificing character traits. And just very briefly, we're going to go over the four things we'll look at uh, over the next few moments together. And they're this. Self-sacrificing love, first, is not jealous. Self-sacrificing love is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not arrogant. And it does not seek its own. The four aspects of this love we're going to look at this morning. A great way to say this is, 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 is this. And it'll be up on the screen. My dad reminded me of this uh, just this last week. Perfect love gives at the expense of self for the benefit of others. So a self-sacrificing of love gives of oneself so that another will benefit. And so let's look at the next set of phrases from 1 Corinthians 13. The first one is this. Love is not jealous. Love is not jealous. Now last week we looked a lot into the Greek understanding behind these words. This week, these are pretty straightforward. Uh, we're not going to go deep like we did last week into that because it's really not necessary. And I'm not even going to try to... Uh, I'm not even going to spend a lot of time trying to convince you that jealousy in the life of uh, anybody is very dangerous, is very damaging, and it's just wrong in the life of a Christian. I think we all know that. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to reconvince you of something you already know. Love is not jealous. But what does that mean? What does that mean? Why is it not jealous? And if it's not jealous, then what is it instead of jealous? That's what we're going to look at. Because our expression of love towards one another is not as much about what we lack or what we don't have as it is about what we do have. What I mean by this is it's not good enough that you simply are not jealous towards another person. If you are not jealous, and that's good of course, but how do you show your brother and sister in Christ that you are not? How do we live love, right? Love, this agape love is a verb. It requires action. It requires us to do something. So just the absence of jealousy in your life is not what God is telling you here. That's good. It's good to not be jealous. And actually, we, we can't be jealous. But how do we express love in a way that's not jealous? That's what we're going to discuss. Before we do that, let's look, at, uh, let's look at God's expression of love towards us. You see, God gives freely to those who ask. He gives, us, he gives to us freely. He never withholds. He never becomes jealous himself when his children excel in their spiritual giftings or their successes. He delights in the increase of our spiritual gifts. He gives us wisdom freely. 
Any loving father rejoices in the successes of their children. Think about that for yourself. Any loving father rejoices in the successes of their children. And whatever good thing that child asks for, the father gives freely and lavishly. Let's look at a couple examples of that from Scripture. James chapter 1, verse 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. Or Matthew 7, 11. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? You see, Love not being jealous is far more than simply resisting the urge to become upset or envious or covetous of what another person has or another person's good fortune. Love, as expressed by not being jealous, is actually rejoicing with others in their good fortunes. Think about not being jealous in those terms. It's not just not being jealous and keeping to yourself. It's actually rejoicing in the good fortunes the spiritual growth, the successes of our brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, love is not grieved or jealous when others grow in their spiritual gifts. When someone's ministry explodes with growth or if someone is given a high position in the church. Love is not upset when others prosper financially. When another Christian gets promoted to the position you wanted. Or a brother and sister is congratulated with honor for any reason. Love not only not becomes jealous, but it rejoices along with them. Love gives freely. And that's the whole theme of what 1 Corinthians talks about. There's always a giving involved in every one of these phrases. Love gives of oneself to another freely. And so that's the question for us. Is that true of you? Is that true of you this morning? Do you give love freely? Do you rejoice with the good fortunes of others? Do you rejoice with the good fortunes of others? Does another brother or sister in Christ, does their prosperity bring you happiness? Because it should. It should. Does it bring you joy when someone experiences God's favor in any way in their life? Even if it's something you desire for yourself, that's a hard one. I've been, in, I've been in ministry a long time, and I've known many people that that's not true of them. That's not true of them. People in ministry themselves, when someone else gets what they wanted, they become envious and jealous. There's no room for that in Christian love church. There's no room for that. And if you're not rejoicing with the good fortunes of others, then what I want to let you know this morning is you're not loving the way God has called you to. You're not even close. For a moment, think of your own children. Don't we want to see them grow in wisdom and knowledge? Grow in their spiritual gifts? We, I want to see my children serve God far greater than I ever have. I want to see them excel. I want them to surpass me in my service and my obedience. It's easy when we look at our children to say that. But church, we need to understand agape love, this love we're to have for brothers and sisters in Christ. We're to want this for all God's children, not just our own biological children, all of God's children. We are not just to be lacking jealousy or envy, but be rejoicing along with those who have, been, who have received God's blessings. And actually, if we're loving God's people the way we're called to, if we're truly loving God's people the way we're called to, then when others receive a blessing, it will actually bring us joy too. So when others receive a blessing, even if it's something I want for myself, their blessing will be my joy as well. And that is really the heart of agape here. Another person's good fortune doesn't take away from my bliss. It only adds to it. Now, that's a different way to think of not being jealous, isn't it? It's much more than just the absence of something. It's much more than that. How many of you can honestly say that you are 
rejoicing when someone else gets what you wanted for yourself. Because that's what we're called to do. And if we love each other this way, then in the end, even the prosperity of others will be will, will uplift us, will bring us joy as well. But how do we do that? Well, it's not easy because our flesh wants to fight against that. Um, but the way I've had to think about this and do this is pray, first of all, pray and decide that every professing believer in your life that you know that experiences God's lavish prosperity in their lives in any way, and I'm not talking about financially here, that, that's just one part of it, any way, any way they prosper, decide in your heart right now, pray and ask God to give you the strength that when they get a good thing, that you will rejoice along with them. You have to make that decision. You have to make the decision you're going to do that. If you don't go, if you don't go into it understanding love in this way, then when somebody gets what's, uh, what, what, what you wanted, you will fail in this, and you will become jealous or envious. But this is the power of true love, church. True love never drags us down. It never makes us jealous. It only uplifts us. So jealousy drags us down, but true love brings us to rejoice. And so that's the first thing that we need to understand. Love is not jealous, but it's more than just the absence of jealousy in our lives. That's number one. Number two, let's look at this. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not brag and is not arrogant. Now I've grouped these two phrases together because they really go hand in hand in the way it's written in the original text, Greek text, it's, it, this is really one phrase. Um, now they literally mean in this, in this state, love is not bragging, is not arrogant, is love is not puffed up. It is not bloated with self-love. It is not bloated with self-love. Now true love does not love, true love does not love self over others. It's really what this is pointing to. Love does not seek to elevate one's own accomplishments, wisdom, giftings, or any other thing above another person's. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Let's look at Philippians 2, 3-4 through 4 really quick. How many of us can say we've mastered this? Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And I think many of us who've been in the church for a while probably know that scripture verse. How many of us live that scripture verse well? You see, the twofold problem with bragging is not only that it seeks to elevate oneself, but it's also designed to tear someone else down. So there's a twofold problem with bragging that arrogance was looking out for your personal interests. You're looking to elevate yourself while simultaneously tearing down another. And this really comes down to a question of who do you honor more in your life? Who do you honor more in your life? The one who is arrogant honors himself more. The one who is humble honors others more. Sounds like simple definition, very difficult in practice. So an arrogant man or woman has very little patience for the faults of others. Have you ever noticed that before? Somebody who's proud or arrogant or brags, they have very little patience for the faults of others. They're the quickest to point out the faults of others and the quickest to give up on others. But they're the slowest to come to repentance themselves. This is why being puffed up with self-honor is so dangerous. But true love, agape love, holds others in higher esteem than we hold ourselves. I have a slide that says a, a neat little saying. True love looks at the strengths of qualities of others and seeks to bolster them and strengthen them and rejoices in the spiritual gifting of others. So true love seeks to, the strengths and qualities of others and rejoices in them. Very related to love is not jealous. But just as important, true love also sees the weaknesses of others. And this is important to listen to. This is important to understand. True love, if you are truly loving the way God has called you to, it sees the weaknesses, the failures of others. And instead of becoming disillusioned or disgusted or upset at that brother's weakness or sister's weakness, they seek to build them up and encourage them. So the opposite 
of bragging for oneself and being arrogant concerning oneself is thinking of others more highly than you think of yourself and building up and encouraging others in spite of their weaknesses. To walk with and to help a brother or sister in Christ, rejoicing in their strengths and encouraging in their weaknesses. It's literally the opposite of not bragging and being not arrogant. But the proud, as I stated before, have no patience for this type of love. They see themselves always as more spiritual, as more knowledgeable, as wiser, as godlier, and as more mature than others around them. And when we act this way, church, when we act as though we are more spiritual, we are wiser, we are more learned, we are better in any way, others ultimately become a source of annoyance to us. And church, we are called to be the source of joy for one another, not a source of annoyance. But the proud and the arrogant, they seek to tear down others by either great disturbance, that's actually what the Greek means here, either great disturbance, or by selective, secretive, secretive slander. The Greek understanding here uh, encompasses both of those definitions. In order to place themselves in a place of higher esteem than others. So when you think of bragging and arrogance, literally the Greek here means that you either use cause a great disturbance of some sort to elevate yourself above another, or you use secretive slander in order to make yourself look better in the eyes of others than someone else. That's literally the definition behind this, this phrase here. And so God's word tells us plainly, love does not brag, is not arrogant, because love doesn't operate that way. Love operates in truth and in the light. And so the question is not simply, are you not a bragging, arrogant person? Of course, I hope none of you are. The question is, do you actively seek to honor others above yourself? Because love is an expression. Love is a verb. Do you actively seek to honor others above yourself? Do you actively seek to build others up and to think of them more highly than you think of yourself? Do you seek to place them in the seat of honor? That's the kind of love we're talking about here. And that goes against our flesh. Our flesh wants the opposite. But that's the question we all need to wrestle with. How good of an encourager are you? Answer that question for yourself. How good of an encourager are you? When you see someone else who is in need of encouragement, do you give it? Or do you seek to point to yourself in some way? Brothers and sisters, if we're truly loving one another, both in this church, corporately and individually, but also the church just in general, throughout the world, if we were loving each other this way, we would bring vibrancy to one another. Instead of what is so often the case, pain, suffering, uncompassion, unforgiveness, those types of things. Arrogance will always cause you to treat others with contempt. Always. And ultimately, it will greatly hinder your ability to both be used by God and to commune with God. So that is important for us too. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. So now we move on. Love does not seek its own. And this will be the last one that we'll look at today. This will probably be the shortest sermon I've preached in I don't know how long. Um, but I wanted to get right to the point uh, this week. I wanted to get right to the point this week. There's a lot of truth here. And a lot of change probably we need to make in our lives. Love does not seek its own. And so this final phrase that we're going to ex examine today, it, again, it's related to the others. Of course, it's related to the others because it falls into this category of, uh, of self-sacrifice. But there is a distinct difference in the behavior that God is trying to warn us against here with this. When he tells us love does not seek its own. Love does not seek its own. Really what God is warning us again is a selfish lust. Selfish lust. Now, lust is most often used in this in, in the context uh, today as a, as a sexual desire 
that is satisfied by using another person in order to quench that sexual thirst? And that, of course, is part of the definition we need to look at today. But, but really what God is warning us against is a lust for anything. Because lust has one goal in mind, and that is to satisfy self. It's the only goal of lust, is to satisfy, satisfy yourself. And self-satisfaction is really the opposite of agape love. It's opposite of the love God has shown towards us. See, when our flesh lusts for something, we will often stop at nothing to acquire that thing for ourselves. Lust is all about self. Regardless of the cost to another human being, lust drives us to take what we want in order to quell that insatiable thirst that's driving us. Someone who seeks their own satisfaction will lie, will slander, will gossip, will cheat, will abuse, manipulate, murder, or any other manner of evil in order to gain the thing that their heart desires for them. That is why God is warning us here. Love does not seek its own. Love does not lust for something at the expense of others. And we live in a society that is driven by lust. You can't even turn the TV on and watch a commercial anymore without lust being used to sell something. Pornography in every way, shape, and form has invaded this culture. We are a lust-driven society. We seek our own at the expense of others far too often. So the lustful person, or the person that seeks his own desires, or her own desires, another person doesn't become an object of love in their life. It becomes an object of to gain a lustful end for them. Another person becomes the means to their selfishness. They place their own well-being in desires above all else. This is why agape love is the enemy, the opposite, the antonym of seeking its own. Now let me say this very, very briefly to understand what I'm saying here. It is godly and right to take care of our bodies our minds. It's good to treat your body as a temple of God and to take care of it. It's good to meditate on the word, word of God to take care of your mind. So I'm not talking about we totally disregard ourselves completely. What I'm saying is that we should never take care of ourselves at the expense of another person. And love never desires to seek its own praise, its own honor, its own profit, or its own pleasure at the expense of another person. And that's how you can, that's how you can uh, test if what your thought is or what your idea is, is lust for yourself or it is truly taking care of your body. If what we desire costs another person something to our benefit, then that is not done out of love. It's not done out of love. Our lust to satisfy our own interests often costs others tremendously. It often causes, causes them their dignity, or costs them their dignity, their hope, their peace, their joy, and many other things. If we seek to satisfy ourselves, we will stop at nothing to gain it. There's often a trail of hurt people in our paths. And so you see, the person who loves with agape love not only resists the temptation to use other for their purposes, they actually prefer, prefer the welfare and satisfaction of others to their own welfare, to their own satisfaction. Again, agape is action. Agape is action. Actively seeking the good and the love of other people. And that's why this is so difficult. This is why this is so hard to do, church. Because the last thing we want to do is place someone else above us. The last thing our flesh wants to do is think of someone else as more honorable than ourselves. The last thing our flesh wants to do is to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. But this is not only on the personal level, the one-to-one -one level, church. 
We have to learn to do this well. That's why we're doing our little uh, agape love initiative this week for the members of the body, right? We have all the families paired up with somebody so they can actively show their love to one another this whole month. Love is an action, but it goes more, goes further than just individual to individual. The one who does not seek their own also seeks the health of God's church above their own interests. And that is important. They seek the health of God's church above their own interests. And so that's why I say love is expressed individually and corporately. Do you love God's people? Amen. Show them you love them. Treat them with honor. Forgive them. Be compassionate with them. Love them in spite of their faults of their, or their offenses. Same with God's church. Do you love God's church, the community of God's people? Okay, prove it. Love God's church. Seek to uphold it, uplift it, and grow it God's way. Never seek to tear it down to satisfy yourself in any way, shape, or form. But again, like I said, we, this is tough for us because we live in a society where self-gratification, we're literally raised in it. Every one of us, even those of us who think we have a pretty good handle on not seeking our own or not being lustful, our culture has taught us it's okay to be lustful. It's okay to seek our own. It's okay to withhold love in any way, shape, or form from another, uh, from another person. We've been taught that. Because if we are not happy, we seek a way to make ourselves happy, right? I mean, commercials are all about that. Advertisements. It's all about something you don't have that you need. Something you don't have that you need. And there's a way to get it. If you don't have enough money for it, just put it on a credit card. We lust in a society we don't even realize it. And we fulfill that lust as Americans almost on a daily basis without probably realizing what we're doing. I really probably only need one cheeseburger, but man, they're only 99 cents, so I'm going to have five of them. That's a lust for something. We fill ourselves with something that is not God and not of God and does not benefit the people of God. Love does not seek its own, church. And we far too often do just that. We've talked about this over the past few weeks, but look at the state of the church today. Look at the state of the church. It's fractured. It's fractured. God's people have fractured from one another. And very often, there's no reconciliation. Look at this culture, this country that we live in. We are fractured in this country. Why? Because we do not love one another. That's why. God's people do not love one another. That's why. We always expect somebody to owe us something with giving very little in return. But brothers and sisters, love does not seek its own. Love doesn't do that. Love seeks to place someone else in a higher position to give them honor, to uphold them, to give them the same respect that you would give yourself, the same love that you would give yourself. In church, we will never heal as a church, both this church, church down the street, or as a country until we learn to love this way. It's supernatural. Think of all the divides in this country, and you know how they could be taken care of? Love. It sounds simple. It's not. It's very, very difficult. That's why we're not doing it. Love would take care of that divide within. And I'm talking within the church, within God's people. We know that for the unbeliever, the gospel is the thing that will heal their brokenness, heal their sinfulness. But within the church, love is what will unite us, church. Love is what will place others in a higher seat of honor than you place yourself. We must understand that seeking our own satisfaction in any way, shape, or form is the opposite of what God has called us to. Love does not seek its own good. And so church, as we close the sermon this morning, I want to remind us that self-love 
in any of these forms that we discussed today does not belong in the life of a Christian. It will only bring you death and harm. We talked about this last week, but the most uh, bitter, resentful people are the ones that first won't forgive the way God's called us to forgive, but also the ones who seek their own desires. It's that insatiable desire. Look, you think of alcohol or drugs or uh, children. I hope most of you don't know what this word means, and I said this before, but pornography. All these things, right? They are insatiable. They can never, ever be satisfied. Ever. You can never drink enough to be satisfied. You can never do drugs enough to be satisfied. You can never experience pornography enough to be satisfied. Yet that's the culture we live in. People go from one thing to the next to the next. Brothers and sisters, the only way we'll find satisfaction is through Christ Jesus. The only way we'll find healing is through Christ Jesus. The only way the church will operate and function the way we've called so that we will be set apart as a city on a hill is if we function in our love for one another. This body has to start. Has to start somewhere. And hopefully it will spill out from this place. Let's look at Romans 12, 3 real quick as we close. It says this, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Think of yourself soberly. You know how I think of myself, and I've had to learn to do this over the years, but it's true. I am no different than any one of you sitting here this morning. I am a wicked sinner saved by the grace of God. That's who I am. And if I think of myself as anything greater than that, then I have a faulty starting point. I am a sinner who by the grace of God's mercy to the Son, Jesus Christ, and His blood shed for me, I am saved. And if you think about yourself soberly, that's who you are too. I am not greater than you. I am not better because I have a position in God's church. I am, this make me any better than any one of you. I am in the same boat as all of you. We must think of each other that way as well. When I look at you, every one of you, I ought to have compassion for you because I know where you've been. I've been there before. And I know what you're saved from, because I'm saved from the same thing. Never think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. It goes back, for those of you who remember the sermon on spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty is something that we don't preach about much in this country. Thinking of ourselves in a low esteem, knowing we are nothing without Christ. But think about this, church. Self-love is the same sin, the same sin that drove Satan to rebel against God and ultimately got him removed from God's presence forever. Think about that. Self-love, arrogance, pride, jealousy is the same sin that got Satan removed from God's presence forever. Satan wished to elevate himself above even God. And ultimately... That's where pride will lead you. And for those of us who have been witnessing out on the street, one-to-one -one with people, we've seen those people who think of themselves more highly than God. And they scoff and they mock and they blaspheme Him. And left unchecked, church, self-love will have the same power in your life. It'll only bring you death. It'll only bring you destruction. And so that's why I say search yourself this morning. If there's even a small amount of pride in your life, small amount of arrogance, if you seek your own in some lustful form in any way, church, it is folly and will only tear you apart. And so let's be sober as we close. If there's any of that in your life, it's too much. How do we remedy that? Well, praise God that we serve a forgiving God, right? Go to the Lord in prayer. Confess your sin to Him. Ask forgiveness and He will heal your brokenness. He will heal your brokenness. But really, what do we have to be proud of anyway? I thought about that a lot this week. What do I have to be proud of anyway? Every one of us here has broken God's law. Every one of us is a liar, a thief, a fornicator. And if you ever hated anybody, we're a murderer in God's eyes. I 
broken every one of God's laws. What do I have to be proud of? I don't boast in myself. Remember Paul writes that. I don't boast in myself. I boast in Christ. The only reason I stand before you here today, and the only reason if you are in Christ that you can stand boldly before the throne of God, is because of what Christ has done for you. What do we really have to be so arrogant about? And I have known some arrogant people in my life, and I have been that arrogant person in my life. What do we really have to be so arrogant about anyways? Is your knowledge truly that much greater than anyone else's around you? Is your spirituality truly that much greater than anyone else around you? Are your spiritual gifts that much greater than anyone else around you? No. If you're loving and serving God properly, you are just a piece. You are just a part of the greater body of Christ. And if we learn to work together, if we learn to love one another together, we can accomplish great things together through how we love one another and how we obey God. We will never, ever, ever accomplish what God has called us to do if we continue to remain separate. If we continue to allow our version of love to be a distorted, perverted, human understanding of love. Everything we have comes from the hand of God. You realize that everything you have comes from the hand of God. And so if I see a brother or sister who has much more than me, I should praise God that they do. Because that came from God. Why would I be jealous of a gift that God has given another? But greatest of all, our salvation was given completely by God. I have nothing to boast for or boast about in my salvation. It was all God's doing. All God's doing. Jesus Christ went to the cross. I didn't. Jesus Christ, Christ paid the price, paid the fine, suffered under God's wrath so that I wouldn't have to. And God called me when I was yet a sinner. Even in our salvation church, we have nothing to boast of. Why do we boast so much? Why do we boast so much? sooner you realize that you are no better in any way, shape, or form than the person sitting next to you, the better off you and everyone else around you will be. Let's say that again. The sooner you realize that you are no better or better off than the person sitting next to you, the better off you will be, but also the better off everyone else around you will be. Because instead of seeking self, you will seek Others. When I see a brother in need or a brother that needs encouragement, I will immediately recognize it. I will go to them and I will love them and I will uplift them. When I see someone, a brother or sister, operating in their strength, their spiritual gift, and I see them operating in that spiritual gift, I will be encouraged and I will rejoice along with them. That is what we're called to. Can you imagine if we did that? Just the difference our relationships would be with God's people. Far too often, church, we let envy and jealousy sneak in because we wanted that thing for ourselves. Again, that's the culture we live in. I want that thing for myself, so I will do anything, anything, and stop at nothing to get it. So my last slide here this morning is just simply this. It says agape is selfless. It lacks a love of self. So my final question for us this morning is, are you? Agape is selfless. Are you? Let's pray.